Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucker, you don't... Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Apologize for the late episode. Aw, yeah. Had some stuff going on. It's been a hell of a week. It's been a long week. My grandma passed. I I'd, I'd told um, our patrons this in our Discord chat, but my grandmother passed. We had her funeral a couple days ago. It's been a bit of a rough week. Yes, and Heather's been sad, understandably. And, uh... What are you going to do? You Try have to pull out an episode at the last minute, Dylan, because <laughs> that is how we roll here at Mountain Murders. No, we missed a midweek and we're late on this week's, but we're going to pick it up right here and keep moving forward. So hopefully you guys will forgive us for our late episode. I hope they do. Sometimes uh, life gets in the way. Uh, unfortunately, we're not, uh, we're not full-time podcasters. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. But if you join us at Patreon.com, you can make that happen. And Dylan, give a shout out to our brand new patron who is sponsoring today's show. I would like to thank today's sponsor, Alexandria. Thank you for sponsoring us over there on Patreon.com slash Mountain Murders Podcast. Over there, like it's its own space. And she joined our Discord. Dylan, we have an exciting announcement. And when I have more information, I will be dropping that. But to let everybody know, we are going to be part of a true crime calendar that we'll be releasing in 2023. I'm excited. We're joining other independent indie true crime podcasters um, to be part of this true crime calendar. It's going to be super cool. Not only is it going to feature these uh, 12 true crime podcasts, but the calendar is going to have all sorts of like important true crime dates. Ooh. Yeah. It's going to be really cool. I'm excited about it. And like I said, when we have a bit more information, we will let you guys know. But hopefully here in the next couple months. You can purchase a true crime calendar. That sounds like a calendar I could get into. I'm going to have to get one. I'm going to have to get 10 of them. <laughs> Christmas gifts for all the friends. Uh, yeah, that sounds a, like a really fun thing to be part of. And uh, we're glad to be asked to be part of that. Uh, wow. Right? That is a, a very specific way of stating that, Dylan. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, so the new Jeffrey Dahmer series on Netflix is pretty pretty damn good, right? Yes. Oh my Y'all, gosh. I'm blown away by it. Evan Peters, probably one of the best actors around these days. Man, he's really good. In my opinion. He's really good how he can uh, change and all the kind of uh, different characters he did in American Horror Story. And uh, I've just enjoyed him every time I've ever seen him in anything. He's a great Dahmer. He is a great Dahmer. He's just nailing it. I He's mean, such a nerd. I just kind of get like uh, almost like he goes method on it without being an asshole about it, but he just seems to really immerse himself in the characters. And uh, I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's a great series. If you haven't started it, gotta. You gotta. Must warn you. I guess this goes without saying because of the subject matter, but not do not watch with kids. It's creepy, right? Because uh, if from what I can, we've watched a couple of episodes. The first episode I found like disturbing. And it's like you're getting an account of each of his victims and crimes, and, and like during the episodes, and it's very, I don't know. I thought I knew everything to, about Dahmer, but um, just uh, I don't know the up close personal nature of the way this is laid out is very unsettling. Yes, and uh, it's good. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it's uh, it's creepy. Just in time for horror season, because honestly, that first episode was like watching a horror movie. It really was. It it was very disturbing. It it's one of those shows that sticks with you, like haunts you for days after. Yeah, it's like meat and potatoes for dinner, right? Like it it like infiltrated my brain, and I've been thinking about that first episode ever since we watched it. Baby. Yeah. 
are you ready to get into today's case, Dylan? Uh, you have a really uh, um, oldie but goldie case for us, and it's a very interesting story. And you actually turned me on to another interesting theory uh, back in the day, which I'll talk about later. But yeah, let's go. Okay, Thomas G. Woolfork. Now, it looks like it's spelled Woolfolk, but I've read it's Woolfork. Woolfork. Yeah. Okay. He was born in Bibb County, Georgia, near the town of Macon on June 18th of 1860. His father, Richard, and Richard's family were loved and respected by all. Richard married his first wife, Susan, Tom's mother, in 1854. Her father, Thomas Moore, was the superintendent of a factory in Macon. Again, prominent, well-respected family. Richard graduated from the University of Georgia the same year he married Susan. Following their marriage, they had two daughters, Fluoride and Lily. Fluoride? Fluoride. Okay. Yeah. By the time Tom was born on his father's cotton plantation. Richard had come from North Carolina and sought his fortune in Georgia. He settled in the rural Macon area, which was still considered virgin wilderness and was mostly inhabited by Creek Indians. The Creek Nation. So there were very few folks in this area. I mean, when we think of Macon, Georgia today, it's, you know, it's a bit of a bustling little city, but nothing like it is today. Incredibly rural. The 100-acre tract that he purchased was ultimately developed into a fairly nice plantation, and he was key in the early growth of Macon, um, Richard. Susan never recovered from Tom's birth, and she passed away in June of 1865. Bibb County, as I mentioned, was really primitive at that time, so it was understandable that childbirth often resulted in death, as we know, um, during that time period, and often, if a mother didn't pass away during childbirth, she might endure lifelong trauma from said childbirth. Yeah, I must say. Because we, the medical care just wasn't there. And especially when you're in this rural wilderness area, she, it's not like she has a doctor or a midwife. Um, it, it seems like a lot for a woman to give birth uh, before our modern day hospitals were there to help. I know some people, you know, want to do the midwife thing and do the at home thing and all that, but you always do have the option of, of being rushed to the hospital if you need it. But it's so dangerous for the mother and the child, um, childbirth. And, uh, we were watching house of dragon actually. And it just seemed, uh, just, you know, if the mom has any problems or hemorrhaging at all, there was just absolutely nothing they could do about it even up through, you know, this day and age you're describing now. So it's a very scary thing. There was no cemetery nearby, so when Susan passed away, she was buried in the yard of the family home, and a holly bush was planted to mark the site. As the Civil War began, Richard moved his three children from East Macon, where they'd been living on the family's plantation, um, and then he moved them to Athens to live with Susan's family. Richard then joined the state troops where he became captain of Company A, which was known as Ross's Battalion. After the war, Captain Woolfork returned to a war-torn homeland, which was in total economic chaos. It was during this time that he opened the first hardware store in Macon called Woolfork and Company. In 1867, he married Maddie Howard. She was the daughter of a wealthy businessman in Macon, and she was a graduate of the prestigious Monroe Female College. This marriage made it possible for Richard Woolfork to establish himself once again as a country gentleman in Bibb County. The gentleman farmer. So I, I would say post-Civil uh, War, you said he returned to a kind of decimated area. Because, uh, you know, Georgia and uh, the Atlanta area caught a lot of hell, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I Georgia mean, burned. The whole Sherman's, Sherman's March. March, yeah. Yeah. He was able to reestablish a home. Unfortunately, his hardware business failed, but he was able to get the plantation back up and running. Young Tom was sent to live with his mother's sister, Fanny Moore, in Athens. 
He lived with Aunt Fanny for the first seven years of his life. Fanny would later marry an architect in Athens. Now, little is known about Tom's early life other than he was known to adore his Aunt Fanny. He was often seen riding with her up and down Prince Avenue, where he resided in her horse-drawn carriage. Of course, growing up during the Civil War and the Reconstruction era was not easy, yet Fanny lived in a nice house which still stands today on Pulaski Street and was home to the Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity. So big historic home still still in Athens. How does a fraternity get a cool historic home like that? Cash. Cash? Money talk still in yeah, that's just not fair that they're partying and playing beer pong in this cool historic house. The Cranes, um, because she did marry this architect, his last name was Crane. So um, Fanny, Aunt Fanny Crane, had chickens and other farm produce to rely on during the war. Athens was also not as poverty stricken as other parts of Georgia. So it's likely that during the war times, Tom may not have experienced like as tough a time, I guess, as other families might have in Georgia. Because, again, they had chickens. They had farm produce. Athens wasn't poverty-stricken. There were more opportunities there. His aunt was married to this architect, well-off guy. Yeah, so, so they were comfortable. Yeah, they're getting by better than most in the area, right? Right. So by all accounts, Tom's childhood remained fairly comfortable considering the circumstances. Now, Tom was described as having a bit of a short fuse, easily angered and sometimes quarrelsome. After Richard's marriage to Maddie Howard, Tom was returned to his father's home. So at age seven, Tom was suddenly sent back to Macon, which was quite an adjustment. Now, he was sent to live with his aunt because his mother was very ill and the war was happening. So he had spent the majority of his young life with his aunt, not with his father. So it's got to be a big change to go from living in Athens, living, you know, kind of a upper middle class, kind of well-to-do life. Yeah, and then go back to Macon where it's a lot rougher. And there's nothing there, right? right? Yeah. Wilderness. So this was a big adjustment for him. And Tom, like I said, he was accustomed to the bustling city of Athens. And now he's suddenly thrust into this new environment with nothing around. And he receives scant attention from his stepmother. In Fanny's care, Tom had been the center of the world. Yet in this house, he was pushed aside. He was living in a home with strangers. And there was a total, eventually there would be a total of nine children in the home. Because the minute Richard marries Maddie, they start popping them out. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids. Nine kids. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, he's got three kids from a previous marriage. He and the new wife start having kids. It's a lot of kids. So poor Tom is thrust in this uh, foreign situation for the most part. And it's just, uh, it couldn't be any more different than his life in Athens. Right. As far as the attention he's seeking. Uh, the state of, uh, I mean, just uh, being in the country now, I'm sure is what it was. So, yes, I, I say it was very unsettling for the young man. Tom didn't get along with his stepmother, and he resented the six children born as a result of this remarriage. Tom saw the half-siblings as an obstacle. They stood in the way of his rightful inheritance, especially as the firstborn son. Tom's behavior toward Maddie was so rebellious that on more than one occasion, he was sent to stay with Aunt Fanny in Athens. But then as soon as he would readapt to life with Fanny, they would return him to the farm in the middle of nowhere. That's probably not going to help his attitude. A lot of instability with the back and forth. When Tom visited his Aunt Fanny in March and June of 1887, his behavior was described as bizarre. She said he seemed paranoid, he paced the floor, he carried a pistol, and would speak incoherently. Aunt Fanny was worried about Tom's mental condition, which she thought was deteriorating. Richard's business flourished, yet it seemed that Tom received less and less attention, the like more success his father had, 
And once he was an adult, Tom tried to find his own success, attempting numerous business ventures, all funded by his father. Yet nothing panned out for Tom. He tried running a separate plantation, managing a store. He opened up a grocery store, didn't work out. Tried driving a streetcar in Macon. He seemed to fail at every turn. He uh, he opened a brothel, it's told. <laughs> tried, tried to drive a stagecoach. Turns out he was no good with a gun and, and was very bad with horses. So poor Tom just couldn't win. Tried clowning. Tried clowning. But he couldn't walk in the size 26 shoes. Got sick on his way over to France to learn it. To be a mime. No, isn't that where the clowns' colleges are in France, right? Some big ones? Come on, keep it going, Heather. Keep sure. it going. I feel like you watched an episode of Baskets. Yeah. And so now you think you know something about, like, French clowning. No, that's totally true. That's where I got all my information on clowns. <sighs> How did I know this? That and Steve-O. I knew this. So Tom didn't have friends so much as he had acquaintances. And he seemed to be hyper-focused on money and property success or the outward appearance of success yet he had little luck in making his own he often told these so-called friends that he hoped to inherit his father's estate yet the more children that maddie added to the mix the less likely it was that tom would inherit his father's fortunes well i mean maybe you could recognize that he is the firstborn, and so if anybody stood maybe to get it when his father passed you know, maybe it would be him, but I don't think you should covet what your parents have to that degree. Well, that's the thing. I, you know I what guess I mean? I, I know people who feel some type of way about like they're entitled to their parents' shit. Yeah, we know but people. I guess I've never felt like that. <laughs> yeah. One, because my parents don't really have anything. And then two, <laughs> they kind of hate me. So I feel like they probably wouldn't leave me anything anyway. Well, even if that, remove those two things, which are rather large obstacles to you inheriting <laughs> their estate, um, I, I just don't, I, I just don't care. I mean, I, I just do my own thing. You know what I mean? How we know people that are like living in their parents' house, it's like they're waiting for them to die so they can take over the house and finally bring a chick over. We, we do know that guy, actually. <laughs> and, but yeah, some people are just uh, totally consumed with things like inheritances or family land or property or, you know, whatever. And I, I don't know. I guess I just never really, uh, maybe it's because I don't have that opportunity. I've just never thought about it like that. Yeah, I've never thought about it like that either. But there are people who seem very consumed with their one day going to inherit some shit. And it's like, why are you, what makes you feel like you're entitled to that? Yeah. Like just because your parents worked hard. And accumulated these things. Like, what are you doing? Go make your own way in the world, right? I don't know. I knew this old man that um, his house is paid for and everything paid for and built the house and all that. Well, unbeknownst to anyone else, he had went and taken like a $75,000 loan out on the house um, just a couple of years before he passed. And he was just spending money like no tomorrow, helping people. He helped his church and you know, just was like handing out hundred dollar bills left and right, you know, and just living his best life. And they were just so like, oh, my God, I can't believe he did that. And I was I was happy for the old man. I was glad he did that. That was his stuff to do it with. You know, he had every right to do that. You think so? I championed what he did. <laughs> OK. 27 year old Thomas finally married a young woman named Georgia Bird, who would leave him three weeks later. George's father was a well-to-do farmer. The couple boarded a train at Holton, Georgia, where her family lived, and were married in the Isle of the Train as it headed to Macon. He told his bride he planned to take her to a fine mansion in Macon, yet Tom had no place to take his new wife except for the home of his older sister. Okay. <laughs> right. And she wasn't having it. Georgia Bird described her husband as not crazy, but mean. She said, quote, he is the meanest man I ever saw, and there is nothing too mean for him to do. Tom had confided in a friend that Georgia was no good. He felt like everyone was against him, and he might need to frail her out, which basically meant beat her into <sighs> submission. Wow. Yeah. So, so three weeks later, she was like, uh-uh. She hit the road. 
So at first I was like, wow, she is, um, you know, what's wrong with her? To, but it seems like she had uh, quickly discovered that she didn't like the person Tom really was. No, he's a liar. And he's lying he to her. He doesn't have a mansion. Right. He ain't got a pot to piss in. So I kind of don't blame uh, Miss And then Bur- he's all like, I have to beat her. Yeah, I got to frail her out. What the hell? I'm going to frail you out. Straighten you right up. <laughs> you can die trying. Oh, my gosh. She's going to puncture my eardrums, I swear. Tom's behavior had slowly been growing more erratic even before the marriage. He had begun carrying a sidearm. He seemed paranoid, discussed how everyone was out to get him, and he had no stability. He had no job, no real place to live. He's kind of floating around. Sounds to me like Tom may suffer from a bit of schizophrenia, Standing honestly. Standing in the corner, being paranoid. With exactly. The, the paranoia and all that stuff. After his marital failure and lack of professional prospects, Tom returned home to his father's plantation. However, Richard was unsympathetic to his son's problems, and instead of welcoming him home, he put him on a payroll, offering him $9 a month, which would be around $251 now, to work as a laborer on the farm. Well, I can't believe that Tom would be happy with that. I think he would view that as below his station. Oh, he was not. Tom, who'd grown up somewhat privileged and had delusions of grandeur, was humiliated. His anger, jealousy, and resentment was quite obvious. I mean, he was not pleased that his father was treating him like a farmhand and expecting him to work for this really small amount of money. Well, his his father could just be trying to teach him a lesson. Maybe she'd just go along with the program and see what happens. You know what I mean? He may bring him on and let him figure this out from the ground up. So he, he could, you know, let him take it over eventually. Well, and he was probably frustrated because he's already funded all of these various business ventures. Right. From driving a damn trolley <laughs> to, like, being a hot dog vendor or some shit. He's probably getting sick of handing his son money. I'm going to operate the rowboat at the lake, Dad. He's probably just like, get a damn job. It was between 2 to 4 a.m. on August 6th of 1887 that Tom knocked on the door of a nearby cabin where a black man named Green Lockett lived. And I think Green Lockett is a cool name. That's an awesome name. Lockett worked for, for the Wool Fork family was one of Richard's farmhands. Well, the man was startled when Tom Woolfork told him something awful had happened. Tom said, quote, Someone got into the house and killed my family. When the men arrived at the Woolfork plantation, Tom urged Lockett to enter the house. Yet Lockett was weary and decided to call on neighbors for help first. When the neighbors from nearby Hazard District finally arrived at the plantation, Tom repeated his tale that someone had broken into the house and murdered the whole family. He had only narrowly escaped by jumping out a window. That's amazing. They killed everyone but you. Yeah, and Mr. Lockett's like, I'm not playing that game. You're not getting me to go in that damn house so you can put this on me. Exactly. <laughs> and I don't blame it's him. It's funny that you said that, Dylan, because that is actually, we're going to talk about that later in our story. That becomes the theory, is that Tom wanted Green Lockett to go in the house so yeah. he could pin the murder on him. In that day and age, a, a black man wouldn't have a chance against the, the word of a white man, let's be honest. As neighbors gathered outside the home, no one wanted to enter the residence for fear of the horrors that waited inside. And of course, they were also worried that the perpetrator, the assailant, could still be in the house. Right. Right? In a later testimony, one of the neighbors said they had heard a noise inside the house. And that's when Tom entered the home to investigate and was gone between 20 and 30, like 20 to 30 minutes inside the house. After this crowd has already gathered outside and no one wants to go inside. When he returned to the group that's been gathered outside, he told the men he had found no one alive. But they wondered what he'd been doing in there for nearly 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take (laughs) that long to walk through a house, even a big house. 
A newspaper, the Macon Telegraph, printed on October 30th of 1890, which was a reprint of the original 1887 reporting. They had reprinted it like, you know, I guess on the anniversary of this crime. Quote, In the back room on the left of the hall, the bodies of Captain Woolfork and his wife were found lying on the bed with their skulls crushed by fearful blows. Across the foot of the same bed was the body of a baby, 18 months old, also with its head crushed. The body of 17-year-old Pearl was found across the foot um, and half on the floor of the same bed. She had cuts on the back of the neck and hands showing she had fought her attacker. It was speculated that the killer had murdered her in another room, likely the hall, and dragged her across the floor and thrown her halfway onto the bed where she was found. Just inside the door was the body of five-year-old Charles. He had entered the room and was hit with a single blow to the head, which crushed his skull. His body was left lying where it fell. A little further in the room was 20-year-old Richard Jr. It seemed Richard Jr. had also fought the attacker, attempting to grab the axe, and it appeared the sharp blade had been pushed into his head, where he had several small gashes. The final blow was delivered to the top of his head, crushing his skull. Jeez. It's horrible. Across the hall was the body of a woman named Temperance West, who happened to be a house guest. Uh, Mrs. West, by the way, she was in her 80s, and she was Maddie's aunt. So elderly aunt had come to stay. Mrs. West had been attacked while asleep. Also in that room were the bodies of 7-year-old Rosebud and 10-year-old Annie. Annie was to believe to be the last victim. It appeared as though the child had tried to hide herself with a sheet. Then she had tried to crawl to the window, but was attacked as she attempted to climb out the window and escape. The paper reported that she, quote, had been slaughtered like the rest of the family by blows from an axe. Almost immediately, everyone gathered at the home suspected Tom. Even before the authorities arrived, neighbors informed him you were under arrest for murder, and if you try to run away, we'll kill you like a dog. That's what the neighbors told Tom? Yeah. So they're not believing anything he said. No, they're immediately like, citizen's <clears throat> arrest, you're under arrest for murder. If you try to leave, we will kill you like a dog. So from their viewpoint, I don't blame them. You have uh, this house where everyone's killed, all the children included, down through uh, almost little babies. And uh, but you you miraculous miraculously survived, right? Yes. You didn't fight. You didn't do anything to try to protect these children or your family, or you know. So yeah, I don't blame them. As word spread across the countryside, hundreds of onlookers began gathering at the house. Every clue in the investigation seemed to point to Tom. Bloody footprints were found in every room of the house. When asked about the prints, Tom never suggested they belonged to anyone else. Like, he basically wasn't admitting they're mine, but he wasn't saying they're not mine. Right, he just <laughs> didn't say anything. Investigators suspected he had tried to lure Green Locket inside the house in order to frame him for the crime. I'm glad they see that. In the bedroom, Tom shared with his brothers, someone had tried to scrub the bloody floors with soap and water, seemed like maybe a few hours after the murders. Tom said he had attempted to wash his feet because of all the blood and had wiped up the floor as well. It was pretty clear to everyone that the perpetrator would have left behind footprints because of the amount of blood in the house, yet Tom's were the only prints available. Tom was also wearing clothing that was too large for him. The clothes were dirty, and it would later be proven that the clothes belonged to his brother, and he had no explanation for what had happened to his own clothing, but was wearing clothing that belonged to Richard Jr. Well, yeah, it was blood, soaked in blood, so he had to change. And Richard Jr., from what I understand, was like a lot bigger than Tom, so these clothes just were like swallowing him up. They were obviously not his clothes. Yes, yes. Yet despite the heinous nature of the crime, a brutal axe murderer of an entire family, Tom remained incredibly calm and collected. 
Witnesses saw Tom sitting quietly under a tree in the hours following the murders. He was emotionless. In another strange observation, Tom asked for a cup of water from the well from a very specific china cup. (laughs) Okay. When the water was brought to him, he touched the cup to his lips, then poured the water on the ground without drinking it. Very normal behavior. Yeah, so according to local gossip, the sheriff noted Tom's refusal to drink the water and had the well searched. Tom's bloody clothes allegedly were dunked in the well. The blood-stained clothes were rolled up in a bundle so tightly um, and wrapped up that the inside of the clothing hadn't gotten wet down in the well. Wow. That's how tightly he had rolled this up. There was a shirt, an undershirt, a pair of trousers, and a pair of underwear all soaked in blood. And the ones in the middle were soaked in blood and wet, but not wet from the water. There was also, when they rolled out the trousers, a bloody handprint on the knee as if someone had grabbed the leg and had left this perfect handprint on the knee of the pants which is going to be an interesting point. Upon discovering the clothes, Tom was arrested by the sheriff, a man named Westcott, and taken to Macon. The crowd by that time was starting to suggest that Tom be lynched on the spot. He was taken to the jail and was stripped. Now get this, Dylan. On his bare leg was an imprint almost identical to where the pants had that bloody handprint. Really? On his leg, yeah. So it had like... So this is Tom's explanation, Dylan, for this handprint. He said that he had put his own wet hand on his leg, and that has that was what had caused this blood-stained handprint. Yet there was no physical way to place his hand in that particular spot without like contorting his body in some very strange way. Yeah, so the blood, whoever put their hand on his knee, it soaked through the pants and, left and stained his leg. A blood stain on his leg. And why is your hand covered in blood? You know what I mean? Even if you are just an innocent person and, you know, had discovered this house, um, why would your hands be covered in blood? Once there was enough evidence to try Tom for capital murder, he was moved from Macon to Atlanta to prevent mob violence. Folks in Macon were outraged and shocked by the gruesome nature of the Wolf Work family murders. Soon the story was not only picked up in the Atlanta newspapers, but was also printed in the New York Times and in newspapers as far as Cincinnati. The press labeled the accused as Bloody Tom. The the press uh, back then especially just had loved names like this. Bloody Tom. They did, Dylan. A Macon photographer had captured a crime scene in the Wolf Fork home and sold copies on the streets of this bloody crime scene. That's uh, that's disgusting. He also mailed the photographs to several newspapers. A copy of the Macon Evening News in 1890 pub- published sketches drawn from the photographs, which they were deemed too graphic to publish, but they did let an artist sketch what was seen in the photographs and they printed that the paper also published a layout of the home with details about like where each body was found because you know that's not gruesome i'm sure people couldn't uh were just shocked by this crime this is how many people nine nine people yeah. murdered slaughtered in this house of horrors yes The funeral procession left the Wolf Fork home around 6 a.m. on Sunday and headed to Rose Hill Cemetery, where all nine bodies were laid to rest. The adults were buried in black coffins and laid out in one row. The graves were topped by brick and are unmarked. The name Wolf Fork is engraved on steps that lead down to the graves. Surprisingly, Aunt Fanny and Tom's two sisters, Floride and Lily, stood by him. Despite the overwhelming evidence against Tom, they never wavered in their belief that he was innocent. Every day, they kissed him in the courtroom and even put their arms up in a protective way when the audience would shout, hang him. Tom was quickly found guilty by a Bibb County jury who took only 12 minutes to render a verdict. 
his attorney, John Rutherford, demanded a new trial. He was granted a new trial in 1889 in Houston County. He was also given a third trial in the Georgia Supreme Court. Aunt Fanny pinned a bouquet of violence on him at each trial, and the three testified about Tom's affection for the whole family. During the second trial, Tom spent the duration reading a book about Napoleon, seemingly disinterested in his own future. He never seemed bothered by the gory details of the murders or by his own circumstance that he could hang for this. So he's like he could just care less. Pretty much. Okay. Tom's attorneys couldn't argue that there had been a third person in the house because there were no footprints, right? Yet all his attorney could really do is claim the evidence was circumstantial, which it was, but I mean, it was damn good circumstantial evidence, right? Many believe Tom had intentionally led Green Lockett to the crime scene in hopes of pinning the murders on him. Then there was the question of what Tom did inside the home for the 20 to 30 minutes after the first witnesses had arrived. Some speculated that perhaps Pearl was not dead and she had been the source of the noises heard inside the house. Tom had gone back into the house and killed her in that time period. And everyone noted Tom's weird demeanor during the trial. As I mentioned before, he never winced, showed any emotion. He's reading a book. He just doesn't seem like he cares at all about what's going on. If you're innocent, and uh, you certainly wouldn't act that way, and hearing this description of your entire family being brutally murdered and left like this, um, I, I got to imagine would get some kind of a reaction out of you, right? You would think. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about this elderly woman in her 80s. All these kids. Your father. Your stepmother, even if you don't particularly get along with her, I mean, she's still been in your life all this time. All and these then kids, all these kids, the Little only kids, an eighteen-month-old baby. And you better believe the jury's seeing you sit there and act like this. You know what I mean? And that's leaving then an impression on them. I'm sure. In 1889, when the Georgia Supreme Court ordered a new trial. He was told he would be retried for the murder of his father. But if he were found not guilty, there were still eight other indictments for which he could be tried. In less than an hour, the third trial in Perry, Georgia, returned a guilty verdict. His attorney fell ill soon after the third trial, and some think maybe if he'd not gotten sick, Tom's life might have been spared. He was finally sentenced and his execution date was set for October 28, 1890. During the trials, many women in Macon began sending Tom letters and gifts such as fruit and baked goods. So there have always been murder groupies. I don't don't understand these women that can look past a guy murdering or molesting or whatever, raping and just be like, well, he's always been nice to me. Richard Ramirez is totally disgusting. I love him. <laughs> and But he was gross. Like, oh, yeah, look at that gum disease. He is sexy. I'm going to write him a letter. I mean, come on. But he likes ACDC. <sighs> yeah. Well, even in the 1800s. And the occult. We've got women sending him fruit baskets. And he's good at sneaking. And perfumed handkerchiefs and shit. But his ex-wife, Georgia Bird, was not so kind. She was very outspoken about Tom and the press and used every opportunity she could to talk badly about him. She was convinced of his guilt. Well, she'd seen him up close and personal, how he just had to, you know, his temper. and He was mean. And these people's name, Georgia Bird, Green Locket. I love it. I love the names back then. <laughs> I know, right? Well, I was just thinking about her. She's probably like smoking a cigarette, talking to the press, like, he ain't no account. (laughs) He's a piece of shit. He wasn't nothing but mean to me. Exactly. She talks like Dell from King of the Hill. He's guilty. A gallows was built for Tom near the Dr. A.C. Hendrick Memorial Bridge. One of the papers reported that between 7,000 to 10,000 onlookers, a large number being women and children, were in attendance. And... 
This was reported, Dylan, that many ate possum sandwiches. Possum sandwiches? <laughs> I had to add that detail. I mean, who even took that detail down at the time? And where do they get all these possums from that were already prepared for sandwich meat? I wonder if a possum sandwich would taste good. People are eating possum sandwiches at the hanging. Oh, my gosh. Let's go to the hanging and eat a possum sandwich. And I would be there passing out rotten vegetables and fruits to throw at them as they take them to the gallows. The area was roped off at the scaffold, and about 200 tickets had been given out to be up front at the execution. Tom Wolfork declared his innocence and said, God bless you all. The rope had slipped from its proper position around Tom's neck and tore the death shroud from his head, which revealed a stretched neck. Seven minutes later, his pulse was still beating strong. Every 10 to 20 seconds, his body would reportedly kind of heave and convulse a little bit. It took 11 minutes for him to die. Ah, uh, he didn't get a proper drop. No. No, it was very gnarly. His body was sent to Hawkinsville, where he was buried in Orange Hill Cemetery next to his older sister, Fluoride. He requested not to be buried with his family in Macon and asked that only his brother-in-law, Mr. Cowan, Lily's husband, be able to view his body. Now, when was a name like Fluoride a good name for any kid, let alone a girl? I Do you think that's strange? I, yeah. Like it even... I mean, I, maybe I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but it looks like Fluoride. Florida. It looks like Florida, <laughs> but with an E on the end, right? Okay. It is fluoride. Florid. Floridi? <laughs> Floriday? I mean, I don't know. Okay, we'll call her Flo. But Tom never admitted guilt. Yet Aunt Fanny and his sister Floride stated that he had exhibited unusual behavior before the murders. In an interview with Athens Weekly Banner Watchman, both women said they had discussed Tom and agreed he was losing his mind. Floride had given her opinion to their father, Richard, like before the murders, that she felt there was something seriously wrong with her brother and that he seemed mentally disturbed. And Richard had disagreed and like shut the conversation down. Damn, Richard. Maybe you should have listened. Ten years after Tom's execution, a criminal named Simon Cooper was lynched in South Carolina in his diary, a note was found. It read, quote, Tom Woolfork was mighty slick, but I fixed him. I would have killed him with the rest of the damn family, but he was not at home. Now, in 1893, a copy of this letter, written by this Simon Cooper, appeared in the Pittsburgh Dispatch. The writer had claimed to be a tramp who had not only killed the Wolfwork family in Macon, but also the Borden family in Massachusetts. The letter said the man and his friends took clothes of the son who had escaped and threw them in the well. The Lizzie Borden family? Yeah. Really? So Simon Cooper claims he murdered the Wolfwork family and the Borden family. Now, in comparing Lizzie Borden to Tom Woolfork, they both had similar situations. Uh, both wanted money from their parents, didn't get along with their stepmothers, and the crime scenes were nearly identical. Both families were killed in August. The Woolfork plantation ended up being divided among the two sisters, and it stood empty for many years. At one point, the Macon Auto Club used it as a headquarters, but from what I understand today, the home seems to be, um, you know, kind of in ruins, out in the woods, wherever. Now, some question the legitimacy of the Simon Cooper's confession because he was a black man and not known to be educated. And for a black man of this time to be literate and as well versed as this diary slash letter would suggest people don't believe it's legit oh if someone's written that and, and claimed he wrote it maybe yes okay because people point out the fact that you know he was a poor kind of transient farmhand likely illiterate criminal you know move from town to town committing crimes and that he was lynched in South Carolina for some other crime. 
um, but had a you know pretty lengthy criminal history, and they doubt the legitimacy of the letter. Well, yeah, maybe it's someone just trying to clear Tom's name or something. There is a childhood rhyme, much like the Lizzie Borden took an axe, you know, gave her, what was it, gave her father 40 wax or whatever. There was a rhyme that went, Wolf Fork, Wolf Fork, look what you've done. You killed your family and didn't fire a gun. Wow. And apparently went around the the kitty circles in Georgia. Why are these kids so dark? I don't know. You know, roses are red, um... Is about the plague. I thought it was Ring Around the Roses. Oh, Ring Around the Roses is about the plague. The plague. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that scary? Because it sounds very innocent, right? But when you know that and you listen to the words and you think about it, it's kind of scary. Pocket full of posies to keep the smell you know of death away. Another disturbing, like, childhood nursery rhyme thing is the one about the. Rockabye baby yeah. and the bow breaks mm-hmm. and the baby will fall and shit. I mean, that's pretty disturbing. Yeah, I know. For one, what's this baby doing up in this tree? It's just not somewhere you should keep a baby. <laughs> right? Irresponsible parenting. It's very irresponsible parenting. Um, poor placement of the um, cradle, let's be honest. And uh, yeah, what's up with all these dark ass kids? Like, can't we just have a nursery rhyme that's like sweet? And you don't find out later that it's about mass death or something? Or mass murder? Well, something that I found interesting, Dylan, that I thought you could discuss with us is there there has been an idea over the years about some of these axe murders yes. being committed by perhaps a serial killer. Yes, yeah, so possibly, uh, according to the authors of this book I'm about to tell you about, um, the most possibly the most prolific serial killer in American history. Um, From the book, The Man from the Train, by Bill James and Rachel McCarthy James, they claim that between 1898 and 1912, a madman was loose in America. Dozens of families across the country were murdered in their beds, bludgeoned with the blunt side of of an axe, which is... I don't know why, but even scarier than using the sharp side. I don't know why that scares me. Some of their houses were set on fire. The bodies of many victims, if they were prepubescent girls, were posed after death. And there was evidence that the killer masturbated at the crime scene. The most notorious of these murders, the June 1912 slaughter of the Moore family and their house guests in Villisca, Iowa, which Heather has talked to me about before, shocked the nation and remains a staple of lurid Midwest folklore. Now, what they're saying is that during those years, all these seemingly unrelated familicides, if I'm saying that right, were possibly done by a transient person riding the rails. And one of the reasons they believe that is because there are some uh, some rather similar, some strange similarities between the crime scenes. And one reason that the crimes remained disconnected a, a century ago was that information was disconnected. And we all know that there was no nothing like crime scene integrity or, you know, the modern day forensic investigative techniques. And, you know, often, just like you said in this story, Uh, The neighbors quickly gathered outside, you know, in a big group of people, and they're just tromping around the damn, the the crime scene. Well, yeah. Tainting it, you know, messing up evidence, and not that they were even, you know, gathering evidence the way we think about it nowadays. And uh, let's see here. The killer targeted houses that were stone's throw from uh, railroad tracks. As the Jameses tell it, he rode the rails, roving from one murder to another, as anonymous and footloose as the hobos who traveled by boxcar. He got work where he could, logging wood in some isolated camp for a few months before moving on to his next kill. And so you, here's the similarities they have between the crime scenes. Proximity to the railroad tracks, death by the blunt side of an axe, which is rather strange, 
the killing of an entire family at once, the posing of the bodies for erotic stimulation, which I always think that's a very uh, deviant thing to do, posing bodies in a sexually explicit way or something after you've killed them. I think that's very creepy. Blankets pulled over victims' heads, covering windows and mirrors with cloth, doors locked or jammed shut, lamps without their chimneys left to light the crime scene, and the list goes on. So, I don't know. Maybe we should look into that. Is there a possibility that there was a transient hobo axe killer riding the rails and killing families all over America? Who happened to find this very rural plantation in Macon, Georgia, and we hung poor Tom Woolfork and he didn't do it? He just jumped out the window and tried to run. All he did was try to save his own skin. Well, to let you know a little bit more about Simon Cooper, this supposed confessor of the Wolf Work murders. Yeah. He was lynched. Uh, yeah, he was lynched in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, he killed a guy on January 1st of 1897 at a celebration like a i don't know some sort of celebration at magnolia so i'm imagining like some sort of new year's day type of celebration it was a bar mitzvah and then um there was a party who tried to arrest him and he shot and wounded five members of the party and escaped then he went on some rampage and killed like some more people including a man wife child uh, and then s- some other random woman and had this large posse pursuing him. So he actually murdered like five people in a day, I think. So Simon was a shitbird as well. He was. Okay. But people point to the fact that, yeah, he was like a shitbird, but they don't know if he would have been like literate and educated enough to write this letter, this diary entry that would later be published in a newspaper. I mean. Well, not only did. The fact of whether or not he could write and was, uh, you know, literate, but also kind of the snarky way it was written. I think they might not, you know, think is the way he would think or talk, right? I really fixed old Tom, that kind of thing. I mean, they may have had the wrong guy here, but let's let's look at this circumstantial evidence. An axe murder, nine people brutally slaughtered. Blood everywhere. Where are the footprints? Besides yours. Besides yours. Besides Tom. Tom's little footprints. And and no one makes it out, but you do. Right? And then they find your bloody clothes wrapped up and thrown in a well. Very strange. For some reason, you're wearing your brother's too big pants. You're obviously... dirty clothes. Yeah, you're not... You're wearing clothes that do not belong to you directly after the crime... And then we find your blood-soaked clothes at the bottom of a well. I mean, I don't know what other... I mean, like you said, it might be circumstantial, but at a certain point, circumstantial, if it keeps adding up, is uh, evidence. I mean, it just proves it, right? Well, and a lot of the research that I did for this story, you had to dig through a lot of old newspaper articles. And there were some folks who wondered why the attorney, Rutherford, didn't try to pursue a... Um, you know, like a mental incompetency uh, type of defense, defense for yeah. Tom because his his aunt, his sister, I mean, people had clearly said he was acting very peculiarly, carrying a gun, really paranoid. I mean, he had, there were multiple people who, you know, were making those statements and that he might have actually had a chance to, you know, either get off or not be executed for the crime. So people were wondering why his attorney didn't like push that as a defense. Yeah, maybe they have a point. I don't know. You know I think but, the guy was suffering from some mental illness. Well, to be able to murder your entire family like that and the people you knew, uh, including all those kids, uh, certainly you're you're not right in the head, right? Something's wrong. Well, I just think with the paranoia, saying everyone's out to get him, you know, feeling like these kids are standing in the way of his inheritance. I mean, it almost seems like a very clouded 
sort of judgment. <laughs> yeah. Right? Certainly so. Well, anyway, that has been the Wolf Work Family Murders. Uh, thank you for that. I certainly had never heard of that, but uh, find it disturbing, um, to say the least. And uh, can I talk about how disappointed I was with our meal that we had before we came here to record? Okay. Sure. <laughs> so yes. we got... I know people are like, whatever, we don't care. We go to a restaurant. No, people do care, Dylan, because our listeners feel the same way. When you go pay good money, right? Now, yeah. we're not talking just some chump change. No. Like you getting a damn $2 hot dog at the hot dog No, this stand. is $20 entrees, bro. But you're getting like, you know, you're paying a pretty decent amount of money for a meal. You expect to get something edible, right? We've been to this restaurant before, and the last time we went, we both really enjoyed our food and raved about how great it was. So I was like, let's go there again. Almost like Southern cooking, homes, but maybe elevated a little bit, you know? I like thought. A, well, that was our experience the first time. Right. It was like Southern comfort, kind of a modern fusion, blah, 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 whatever thing. Okay. So I'm like, I'm going, I want some damn meatloaf. I've been thinking about meatloaf for a week. I don't know why. I'll just make my own. And so Heather gets this little bacon Santa Fe chicken thing. And like, <laughs> we both get our food and I'm just like, the asparagus was undercooked. And I'm just like, how do you Plus fuck they up they gave asparagus? you like four pieces. Four sprigs of asparagus. Yes. I'm like, okay, I was cool. I like, huh. And I get my meatloaf, and it is seriously like um, some kind of uh, Salisbury steak patty things that you would get out of a freezer with this chipotle sauce just drowned all over it. They drowned uh, Heather's Santa Fe chicken. Yeah, so I had this Santa Fe chicken oh breast, God. okay? And it was supposed to be like um, bacon, cheese, uh, avocado, and this... Chipotle sauce, right? But it was so drowned, drenched in the sauce that like you couldn't taste the chicken. And I don't know whose auntie was in there with the fucking Lowry's, but calm down. Somebody put Lowry's like all up on my shit. They like dressed her plate with Lowry's seasoning. And I people. was just like, who is in there cooking? Like my drunk aunt? Come on now. This was one of the most underwhelming meals I've ever eaten in my life. And it cost us like 60 bucks. And I was just like, what happened? What happened to this place? Chef Ramsey would be tearing this apart if he was tasting this no, right I now. No, I know. I gave you my rendition of what Chef Ramsey, because we've been watching a lot of like kitchen nightmares <laughs> and shit lately, I, of what he would be saying about this. Yeah. I was like, what is this inedible sauce? Oh my gosh. But I really do. I feel like my drunk aunt was just like grilling and just like hose the Lowry's down or until her shit. ancestors told her to stop yes yeah you know oh my gosh okay that's enough of that nobody wants that, to hear that yeah the loud i mean i don't understand it was a lot and, and, and our waitress was great she gave us great service very attentive so i still tipped her well it wasn't her fault the slop that's coming out oh of the my kitchen God, the food was so bad but i was just I was uh, disappointed i'm surprised how night and day it was from our our our, our, our first experience to this uh, I don't think I'll ever go back. So I'm not even going to name the restaurant. No, it doesn't mean, matter. To me, there's just nothing as sad as a disappointing meal. Because you know I love to eat. I love food. I really appreciate a good meal. And when you go out and you're expecting, like, one thing and you end up with this just... Look, here's the thing. It was so bad. If I'm spending 18 or $20 on a meatloaf dinner... I expect real hamburger. I expect a ham padded real meatloaf. You mean like ground beef? Ground beef, yeah. Not some That's such a southern thing to say. If when you're talking about ground beef, people will be like, you know, hamburger meat. And I'm thinking, just say ground beef, Dylan. It's I'm fine. gonna call it hamburger meat. Yeah. I expect real hamburger meat. <laughs> and this shit was literally meat off of a loaf. <laughs> some kind of freezer loaf. Like that damn chopped ham, you know how uh, ham ham in a can. That well, comes? I'm pretty sure they drowned my chicken in chipotle sauce or wherever the fuck that was oh because it was like a craft single cheese melted on there. <laughs> but I couldn't even like differentiate what was the sauce and what was the cheese. But oh the cheese was super melty, and I was like, I think this is like a Velveeta slice of cheese. Yes, like this is terrible. 
This is not what my Santa Fe chicken should be. It it was really bad. It was like a Santa. You got us ended up with a Santa Cruz chicken, I think. <laughs> I don't even think. Well, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what it means either, but it wasn't Santa Fe. It was a disappointing Santa Claus chicken. I'll tell you that. All right. Well, th- uh, we'd like to thank Alexandria for being today's sponsor of this episode. I'd like to thank you, Heather, for throwing that story together for us. So we're able to be here for the listeners, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and sticking with us. We're going to keep it rolling, folks. May your meals be amazing this week and not drown in chipotle, chipotle sauce. sauce, okay? Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye.